Hi, Dr. Rob, how are you? Hey, Tammy, I'm working on help us connecting here, but I'm pretty good, thank you. That's good. So now I lost your video. Yes, I'm aware. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna there start go. with, okay. I'm gonna, I'm going to put this in the answered questions. So the first question is, this is a topic that has come up in our support group meetings. A recovering SA has done his prescribed abstinence period, 90 days or whatever, and he has masturbation in his inner circle. His wife partner has no interest in having sex with him and there is no plan addressing him. At what point can he remove masturbation from his inner circle and under what conditions? Well, um, this feels and sounds a little too- oh. We lost Dr. Rob, or did you? No, I'm still here. So I'm still here. Reality. He'll come back. I don't know where he went. I was fascinated to hear. There he is. Hi. I don't know. I'm going to make you co host just in case, too. But anyway, this to me sounds a little, and then you disappeared. You know, being an addict myself, I understand the worst way of thinking, or at least what I perceive to be this way of thinking. And I, I can't see the question now, sorry. But there's okay. something in there about- So let me reread well, it. it. But it's that's okay, like, I just want to, okay. let me say this part because I'll forget. Um, and thank you. I, I hear a little bit of, I'm a husband or a, a, a male partner, and I've done what I'm supposed to do. And so when do I get to have sex again? Now, I could be wrong and- if that's where you're coming from, remember we answer these questions in a broad way and it may not absolutely apply to you, but there does feel like some kind of like fingers drumming, drumming on a tabletop message to hear. And I don't think, just like you can't say 90 days means this or that, it's different to every couple and person. I'm not sure you can say this is when you're ready to have sex, you know, in like 6.3 months, you know. So what are you thinking, Tammy, as you read this? I was thinking that I'm, I'm thinking that the partner uh, spouse is not feeling safe yet, that there hasn't been, so that the, the days have been checked off on the calendar, but there isn't, a, uh, there isn't a shift where, where there's trust being rebuilt, there's actions, you know, it's, it's been like you said, you know, fingers drumming or like, okay, time is up, time is up, you know, there isn't, I, you know, there isn't a magic number of like, oh, and now everything's going to be great, you know, 90 days, 120 days, and whatever. It's more about what have you done during the 90 days or whatever to change so that your partner starts to see that you are working on being different. But, you know, I, so the other thing I was thinking is how many years, decades did your partner they have to learn about your betrayal. So 90 days is a drop in the bucket. So, so say, say you acted out, watch porn, did whatever for 10 years. And now 90 days, I mean, like if you think about mathematically and if my brain was really functioning quick, I would figure that all out. But it's basically about 1 40th of the time in a decade. So it, it doesn't equal. And it doesn't, you know, there's no just, magic number so uh, to me it's more their trust has not been rebuilt there aren't sh signs that wow this person is changing and I do want to you know come together in a sexual way with this person so well, I do want to add that there's nothing wrong with having a plan I think a plan is a fine thing and going to a therapist but I think that there are kind of check marks along that plan like we um, we spent an evening together where we just had fun doing this, or we went away for the day and we did that, or we, you know, that, that you have some sort of, okay, we had a fight, but it didn't go here, you know, that you begin to have some reliable signs, both physical and emotional, that things are getting better because the sex has to come out of that. It can't just like, uh, and you guys hear me say this often that for recovering addicts, sex needs to come out of intimacy not intensity and so you know i hear someone who's like you're where's the excitement i've been having this excitement now you're my only source of this excitement let's get going going and i you know i, I think that while, while that may be comforting and may be sexual i'm not sure it's going to move a relationship forward that's been hurt like this so yeah and i th think uh, one more thing is and it doesn't have to just be sex it can be you know we talk 
about sensate focused, you know, and, and dating, I mean, like start back up, you know, like, can you just, right, what a you know, second. can you, yeah. Can you just, you know, hold hands while walking through the park? I, you know, like those are the things that build intimacy that aren't intensity. So, you know, I just wanted to say one more thing. Uh, this has been ringing in my head all day. I, I wish I had the interest in putting up a Twitter, but I was thinking to me today, today that love is really about the mundane. Love is really about the day-to-day rhythms, the day-to-day expectations, the day-to-day, you know, shared interests. I mean, that's what love is. It isn't about those special, important moments. Those special, important moments reflect the day-to-day. But who decides to do the laundry and who does the dishes and what are we going to watch on TV tonight is what love is. As much as anything spectacular that happens when you have sex, at least the, in fact, I would say that the days you don't remember add up to a lot more love than those one or two times that you absolutely have not forgotten anything about. But I don't know, Tammy, I just wrapped that out of my head. Do you have any thoughts about that? No, I was thinking today we put out, we, we my husband and I, created we made our own homemade ant traps and like that was our love today was putting ant traps out so so you're you're murdering (laughs) other creatures with your love they were biting my ankles like insane so yes yes you have to defend yourself yes okay next question i put it in the answer hello i'm the sex addict i've been actively recovering for four months now i'm curious about signs of success i'll likely see or feel as i recover it's is it like beauty integrity is in the eyes of the beholder? Well, that's a lot of different questions. Um, so when they, so I'm going to break this down to little teeny pieces and you'll see some Tammy that I don't see for sure. But you know, the first thing I see is I have been actively recovering for four months and I don't know what active recovery means for, to one person may be very different than active recovery for someone else. So you know, for one person, it might be, well, I am only masturbating once a week to porn and I go to a support group online once a week. And for someone else, it might be, you know, I've gotten into therapy. I'm doing, you know, I, I don't know what that means to you. I also don't know what, when you say about a sign of success, I think you're right really to think about it as part of it is how much time do I have not acting out? But part of it is also, how do I feel about myself? How am I responding to other people? I I agree with you that it is a larger piece. And I, and I think it's easier to say, well, I have 23 days without looking at porn than it is to say, I've been more empathic and a better communicator for 23 days. And those issues take longer, but um, this is going to sound like a, a bit of a sneaky question, but it's really quite true is, um, I feel there's a little too much focus here on my signs of success. And I'm wondering what I would be doing is going to 12 step meetings and support groups and watching other people and thinking, wow, they came in like this and look, I wonder where they are now. And, and am I doing the work they need they're doing, or, you know, I wouldn't just be focusing on me. I'd be focusing on how others are experiencing their recovery. I'd be focusing on their partners and their relationships um, and I don't think it's like beauty that the eyes in the, in the eye of the beholder at all, because, you know, that's like saying, well, I'm a dr- fall down alcoholic and I pass out in the street and that's not very pretty. But if I just sit alone at night and drink a couple of bottles of wine, then that is pretty because it doesn't look as ugly to me. And so whether you're going to a sex shop and jacking off to to unknown porn with people you've never met or you're having a, you know, a high end affair with a two thousand dollar night sex worker um you know neither one has any more integrity than the other because you're not uh really engaged with these people you're using them so anyway that was sentence by sentence there Tammy. Yeah. i'm eating dinner well, by the way so no the, so signs of success i was like i, I mean i I think you'll, you will start being more engaged with other people. You will care more about them than just about you and, and getting what you want, et cetera. So it's, it's not about being self-focused. The integrity, I think integrity is, is pretty black and white. It's like, you know, you either have it you know, or you don't, it's not shades. Well, it's only a little lie. It's a little cheating. It's a little, whatever. It's like, that is not, um, uh, hang on, I got to hit. Of course, my phone goes right then. 
Well, integrity mm. is something, integrity is simply being the same person all the time without any yes. surprises. So it's not that whether I people would, are watching or not. Yes. Yeah, I wouldn't want my, my neighbor to see that I'm taking a shower in the morning because that's private. But if they said, did you take a shower this morning? I would say, absolutely. I still have integrity. They don't see everything, but they wouldn't experience me as someone who, who would believe that that person would do that, that I'm clearly hiding things. And that's a lack of integrity. Um, and that takes time to automatically begin to want but at the same time, it becomes clearer and clearer what it, what it is. Um, and what it that's isn't. why we named our treatment center Seeking Integrity County. Mm -hmm. yes. Sorry. I also put in the chat, there, I mean, when you shared, I was like, wow, I, you would so benefit from participating in the Sex and Porn Addiction 101 Level 1 course. That, you know, that's the kind of stuff they talk about and getting that foundation and connecting with other people. It's facilitated. Um, so I put a link in there. It starts next Saturday. So check it out. Um, um, but that could be a really good foundation piece and answer a lot of the questions, but also provide you, you know, with, oh, here's my outer circle. Uh, and those are the things that I'm engaging more in those. So this is a measure of success. So, okay. Yeah, no, I agree question. with you, Tammy. I was just going to say that, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. That, you know, when, when, when I first put out Sex Addiction 101 and then the workbook, it was sort of up to the person and their sponsor and their therapist how much they were going to do and how much they were going to get done and what they saw as success. And But I do think when you put a bunch of people together and they're, they're holding each other accountable and they're talking about what they're doing, it's easier to measure. This is how far I got. And I agree with you. I'm, I, uh, I think that was a very good response. Thanks. You're welcome. Next question. I was exposed to pornography at the age of seven and have struggled with porn addiction for 32 years. How does early exposure to pornography and sexual uh, harassment affect the development of the brain and coping mechanisms? Well, those are two different questions, pornography and sexual harassment. In other words, I might have been, you know, five, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and ran into a stack of my dad's Playboys uh, I'm just making up the suburban scenario, and I would have been exposed to pornography at a very early age, but that's different than um, sexual harassment, which has to do with people who have power over you, making demands of you because they have an opportunity to be sexual with you, and so they're demanding things. Um, uh, Tammy, do you think you can differentiate that or Maybe we can answer both. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't. I, and, you know, and this is very much the development of the brain. I mean, you, you have talked often about, you know, pornography and how, you know, we need to protect young children and a seven-year-old is clearly a young child. So, you know, as for, you know, how it wires and all of that, I guess, I, I think that that's all interesting and, and, and whatever, but what I hear is somebody who struggled with porn for 32 years. And what I don't hear is the question of rather than looking at why this happened and how the, you know, neural paths work, like, what can you do now at age 39, I presume, to, to be on a different path. And so, so I would invite you to flip the question and like, how can I stop, you know, stop being affected negatively by something that happened to me at a young age and move into a different, different place, so. And, and Tam, you know, I'm always gonna to respond to that by saying, you know, uh, we have guys at the treatment center who I'm gonna go see tomorrow. And the first, and some of them I haven't seen, like five of them or something. And one of the first things they ask at Seeking Integrity is, well, why do I have this problem? And, and what happened in my childhood? And, and why is it my spouse and I relate this way? And, you know, they're, they're, it's good that they're answering, asking questions, but they're not asking the right theme. The right theme of questions is how, like you said, how did I get here? How can I find my way out? How can I recognize when it's about to come, uh, come up for me? How can I find a way to turn to someone and tell them my truth when I really just want to go act out? It's the active, more active. And this is why I think, sorry to go on, a lot of therapies are not as effective as they might be because most therapy is about opening up and you kind of lead the way with a the therapist. And there is a lot of why, you know, what does that, what, what does that mean to you? And how did you get there? And, but in addiction to treatment, it's much more directive and it's much more about these are the things you need to do if you want to stop doing that. And these are the things you need to become aware of if you want to change that. And it's much more an active, how do I? 
than a why do I? Anyway, <clears throat> I want to mention that because people come to treatment and they think they're going to go through 20 years of discovery. And somehow that the discovery of the past, mom did this and dad did that, will equal, I don't struggle with this anymore. And I think that, that it, you know, a lot of people kind of get fooled with that idea, Tammy. I think you hear that all the time, actually. I, I do, and I hear from partners. So, I mean, this is a really important question is, you know, because they're like, you know, why did a female partner, male addict, just for pronouns, but um, why why is he doing this? And it's like, if if I can figure out why, then I can prevent him from doing this again, when, and then we'll be okay. And it's, you know, it's so it's so much shifted from that. It really is like, stop the behavior and then, you know, like pick away at the layers, but address those triggers, you know, so you, we can have discoveries years and years later, you know, that add to our recovery, but we didn't have to know those on day one. And for some of us, if we'd learned some of this stuff on day one, we would have, you know, gone right back to the addiction because it was too painful. So, so I think there's a reason, but it's a path and it's a journey. And, and I get a lot of calls too, where we're going to fix this. I want to get over this. And, and, you know, I really, you know, I got to tell you, this is a chronic condition and we can on a daily basis have a reprieve, but we have to do things on a daily basis in order to, to like, we have to not do the things that are problematic, but we also have to do the things that feed our souls, you know, and help us be connected in a healthy way to people that care about us. So, you know, I was going to say the reason, uh, cause you reminded me of this <clears throat> when, why is important. And why is important is when people hate themselves mm. and they think, you know, I'm such an awful person and shame, right? I, yeah. I, what's wrong with me? I'm a terrible person. I never should have done this to these people. I must be malicious. I must not have good values. And, you know, that's when I might turn to why and, and say, you know, but this really bad stuff happened when you were growing up. It wasn't your fault, but that might be some a why that may be that you had a little bit of a broken past because I think it's kinder and often more true to say to somebody, you're not a bad person, you're a broken person. Mm -hmm. You look at how, look at the why. And that's enough in the beginning to reduce shame and have someone say, okay, I am not worth hating. I just missed out on a whole bunch of stuff that I need to miss out on. And I've made a lot of choices trying to make that up that didn't work out. But if you're broken and you have people supporting you, you can you can repair it won't completely fix and erase the the cracks and mars but but you can move through that the pieces can come back together again so i hope okay. so tammy yeah i know so okay so next question my spouse started using porn in 1997 and that's all he admits to we have seen the only CSAT in our state who is retiring for the disclosure process. I'm looking for another therapist who is not retiring and has appointments. Oh, this is one of those. I'm going to, so email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com and tell me where you're located. Um, but that's, a, I, I can't do that off the top of my head and on a recording. So email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Um, and I will do my best to help you find somebody. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, hello, I have a childhood abuse background. I'm having a problem removing the self-hatred from my acting out behavior of using porn in excess. Is there a healthy way to restructure this in my mind? Well, there's different pieces to this, right? There's self-hatred around sexual acting out, which is for this person using porn in excess. And I think that there's nothing wrong with feeling badly about behavior that, that goes against your values or hurts other people or something you don't believe in. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't like the fact that I compulsively masturbate to porn and, it, and I do it to excess and I don't like that broken part of me but that's very different than saying um that um i'm having a problem removing the self-hatred for my acting out behavior um of, because um the self-hatred and the acting out behavior don't have to be connected you can feel you know and you often hear these things said you can feel guilty which is a, or even remorseful guilty like i i don't like 
who I've become and I don't like how I'm treating people and, you know, guilty about, I didn't, I don't like that. I didn't show up for that person or you can have remorse. Like, um, I wish I hadn't hurt them or I wish I hadn't let them down or, but self-hatred is not productive. That that's more a form of shame. And as we often say, often say in treatment centers, it's kind of a standard line. We can't treat bad people, you know, bad people who have the, who, who should be self-hating um, whether they act out their behavior or not, are not people we can help. We, we do treat people who feel terrible about what they did, who feel motivated to not cause pain again or of other people. So let me just answer the quick version to this question, which is, I think that you are doing exactly here the healthy way of restructuring it in your mind by reaching out and saying, this doesn't seem right to me and I wanna talk more about it. And boy, there is nothing more healing than a motivated mind that wants to seek out change you can i can do a lot of things tammy can help a lot of people but what we can't do is help people be motivated and you are motivated to want to understand i do think the more people you surround yourself with who are in the same struggle as you will reduce your shame because it's just so much easier for me to say, oh, I'm not a piece of crap when I see a very interesting, very nice person, not unlike my friend or brother or whatever, and they're struggling too. It's very easy. I know it was for me when I was acting out to think I'm the only one in the world who's like this, even though I was acting out with people. <laughs> like I knew that in my head, but the, the, the shame led me feel like no one else does. And, and meeting people, interesting, engaged, motivated people who wanted to create change, who weren't horrible people, um, and engaging with them and getting their support also went a long way toward keeping me from hating myself. Um, this is an important question, so I wanted to give it a little time. Is there a part you want to add, Tammy? Well, I, I, I joining groups. So we have drop-in groups for men and a separate for women. So, um, but that shame is real and a barrier. So I, I'm glad you're here and asking questions. We have a number of webinars. Um, Kristen Snowden does a lot on shame, um, but you'll also hear Troy Love who does um, a lot of the attachment wound work and you've got, I mean, just from, you know, abuse is one of the issues. So I would invite you to Troy Love's groups and webinars. Again, email me if you've got questions, if you can't find them, but on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, all spelled out, you'll find previous webinars, podcasts, the, the drop-in groups. There's just a ton of resources that I think you'll start putting those pieces together. Um, but again, email me if you've got questions. Okay, next question. My husband is coming home from, from our treatment center this weekend. What should I expect? Where will his mind be? From seeking integrity? Um, well, I, I think it depends. Well, Tammy, why don't you start off with that question? Because I bet, I bet every spouse you've ever talked to, male, female, trans, straight, gay, whatever says, what is my spouse going to be like when they come home? I know everybody does. So I'd love to hear your answer. And I'm happy to. The, so every partner spouse receives a, that as long as we have a release in their names, receives the partner and spouse expectations. We, we tell them what's going to happen during treatment. And then we have a therapist um, that is the, the family specialist that reaches out, you know, and is guiding the, the connection with, with partners. So, so, you know, I mean, it really depends. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know clinically what is happening and it would be inappropriate for me to say anything on this this side anyway but but really i think you know making sure your your partner your husband will have an aftercare plan and your um the, the family specialist will be discussing that with you as well i mean i mean everything um it's not done in a vacuum and as long as releases are signed we do everything from a pro-dependent lens um but you know it really it it depends on you know where your husband's you know growth has been and it's only Monday of the second week. So it's still like, it, it, we have a 14 day program and they do a lot of work, but, um, but it's only Monday of the second week. So he's been there a week. So, so I think well, you'll, you'll hear more from our staff. Well, and, and I, I do understand that somewhere around Tuesday of the second week, like they are now, they're starting to think about when I go home, 
And oftentimes they've gone through some kind of engagement with the spouse in a formal way, like in therapy or treatment. And so they're looking toward the future and they've been chatting together. And so both partners are kind of saying, what's, what's going to happen? And I do have to bring them back to it's just today. And, and in treatment, things go very quickly and a lot can happen in two days. So why don't we just say that things are doing however they're doing today. But there is a question in here that I wanted to respond to, which I I think it is premature to be asked. I understand the ask, and I don't think I've ever talked about this town. But you know what? Are the let's say we have. We Hang have on a do, second. Okay. Your, your micro, you sound like a, kind of a chipmunk right sound, now. You, you sound like a chipmunk. Is it me? Oh. I think so. Maybe but we both sound see. like chipmunks. Maybe the chipmunks have. No, I don't think this is me. Okay. Oh, now you're back. Okay, now I hear you're clear. Okay, that was right, weird. Well, it is. It's just a Zoom demon. Um, but this is a really. Uh, it's my mic. I don't know. Maybe. Sorry about that, Abby. Anyway, but yeah. But anyway, let's go back to the question. It's a really good question. And there was something. Oh, the timing. So what are what are they thinking about? So when the addicts are coming home, there are some general things. If they're in a committed marital relationship with a man or a woman. And, uh, you know, I could speak separately maybe at another time about the ones who are going home single or the ones who are not going home to a partner, they're more going home to a separation. Um, but speaking of those, those who are coming back to a relationship, in general, um, it can, it, it's one of two ways. You know, either they understand how, how distant their partner is being in that moment. And even though they may be living in the same house that that there's a real sense of we're not sure this is going to work out um, and it's going to take a while. And then there are other couples I feel like they, by, you know, by the time this person's get ready, getting ready to come back, that there's this kind of joyous kind of, wow, we've been listening to each other on the phone and you sound different and the plans we're making going forward sound right to me. And uh, you often, I like the therapist and I think they have it in mind and now they're going to be sharing with your therapist. So, you know, I think uh, not that you guys aren't anxious, but um, I do think for us, and I'm speaking for all these guys I've worked with, there is this sense of hope and excitement, which we try to foster, by the way, we, because that we know that they're going to go home to a, a difficult times and not always being loved or appreciated for the basic things they need to be doing. So we try to help them see the trees for the forest. Did I say that right? The forest. Because we want them to see that there's love, there's caring. You know, this is why you'll hear me say, say all the time, the opposite of love is, uh, is not hate, it's indifference. Because I figure as long as you spouses are in the party, are at the party and you're angry and you're frustrated, you're this, you're that, you're still at the party. So I have, but I have to teach the addicts that, if they get angry, if they don't want to be with you tonight, if they don't trust you, that doesn't mean that they're walking out the door. That is their ability. That is the best they can do to say you've hurt me so deeply. And so everything's kind of shifted and teaching both sides how to manage that, I think, is part of the challenge. But there's, oh, what else are they thinking about? All of the men who are leaving to a spouse are thinking, um, I, I want to be like this forever. And now I know how to reach my spouse emotionally because it's happened a little bit at long distance. And now this is going to be like this for going forward. This is it. We found the mountain and we're living there. And, you know, I think not only to learn how to be a healthy, intimate couple, but also to maintain it during a lot of stress is hard enough in the best of circumstances. And I would say that most important for especially the addicts is to lower your expectations. You know, you're not going to go home to a, for the most part, to a spouse who's going to be embracing, excitedly embracing your recovery um, when they have to sit still with what you've done. They're glad you're home. They're glad you're not ill. They're glad you're working on it, but they're still hurting. They're still angry. So I think that the people who come through are wary of that. They're on their best behavior for sure. Um, but that doesn't mean they're lying. It, it means that they're really, really afraid you're going to walk. Um, last thing. I do think that the men I work with who come into treatment and seeking integrity by the time they get through, if they realize that, that you are important to them, they, they love you, they get it. 
they realize what they haven't done. They Now the ones who are ambivalent might get more ambivalent about the, does this relationship work for me or maybe this spouse and I hurt each other. But the ones who come in hoping their spouses will make it and the two of them will get through and they'll be able to raise these grandkids or whatever, um, those are the ones that I just, I, you know, I have a lot of hope for and I see a lot of a lot of good times ahead, despite the pain that is in the short term. Tammy, I said a lot of words. I said you did, <laughs> and I, mean, I think the one thing I'd want to tag on is and and be really aware of where your mind is. So like you know, uh, make sure that you're getting support for you because this is another transitional time. So making sure that you have support, um, uh, I think, will be really important for you too. So. Okay, next question. Is there a high correlation between intimacy disorders, sex addiction, porn addiction, and ADD or other brain disorders? As my ADD is being treated and having a lot of success, are there different therapy considerations when ADD or other disorders come into play with intimacy issues? Well, um, there, there's sort of technical answer here, which is about 20% to 0% of uh, male identified sex addicts also have ADD. Um, the a both the ADD and the compulsive behaviors of all kinds come from a very early part of the brain stem. I'm pointing back to back of my head because these are parts of the brain that establish when we're very little, but that we usually don't even remember, but they're patterns of relating and satisfaction and uh, feeling safe and uh, feeling trusted, you know, all of the really basic emotions and connections that we have early in life. And so it would make sense that someone who has challenges with certain parts of their brain where it had early development might also have some challenges related to addiction. Um, but you have to also have to understand that this is also the part of the brain that is affected by trauma. So if I have a high amount of emotional trauma and stress and cortisol release and adrenaline when I'm five and six and seven, my brain is gonna develop in a particular way in addition to the ADD or a problem that may have been there all along. And by the way, if you are interested, there's this whole, uh, to me, fascinating part of genetics called epigenetics. And epigenetics, for example, means that, and I'll speak about myself, I had a bipolar mother, a profoundly bipolar matter, ma mother, which is a genetic defect about how her brain functioned and how it released certain chemicals. And um, do I have the, the genetic predisposition to be bipolar? I absolutely do. Am I bipolar? Well, that really depends on how my nature experience went, nurture experience. So the nature is, could I get this bipolar or not? It's a, it's a gene, it's there, I could get it. But the nurture part is, did I grow up in a calm, supportive, nurturing relationship where that gene never took off and I never got bipolar? Or did I grow up in a really stressful, anxiety-producing relationship where that gene to, that expresses this mental illness came alive? So there's a whole stage in the nature, nurture, nurture, nurture process that one, we are guaranteed to possibly have something. And then should our external world not go well, then we may well just end up with it. So whether somebody could end up with ADD and not have sex addiction, absolutely, about 80%. Could someone have both? Absolutely. Do they both reside in a similar part of the brain? Yes, but could they come from completely different areas? Yes. And if you're asking, could we medicate away addiction? No. Great answer. But I mean, I do have seen a higher correlation of people with ADD in 12 step. So maybe because we're all fidgeting sitting around. So <laughs> let's move on, Tammy, let's move on. So the next question, and I wanna parse this one out. What percentage of essays in recovery relapse or have slips? And I wanna start with the in recovery because there are people that are in abstinence and then there are people that you know are starting to try to work a program. Recovery is like, I mean, recovery is people have really adapted and get, gotten it into their lives and things like that. So, so I see it as different stages. And, and to me, somebody early on, you know, is far more vulnerable. Somebody who has, you know, got some, you know, has got the support, has gotten really worked on their recovery, you know, has, has knows more the right thing to do and is more likely to do something, but rather than, you know, slip or relapse. But this is also an opportunity for you to talk about the difference between a slip and a relapse, please. 
Are you talking to me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, I, I, I guess my answer was a little bit different, um, but I think we're basically in the same place. Um, what percentage of sex addicts in recovery collapse, relapse or have slips? My answer is all of them, 100%. I don't think that we are always honest about it. I think that we minimize the small ones to the, the folks we love because we're afraid of what you will do. But I've never met a sex addict who doesn't have slips. This is not alcohol or drugs. This is not something you take out of your life and never replace it again. This is something that we face every day. If you ask me if people with eating disorders ever have slips, the answer is frequently, not all of them, but many of them do because you're dealing with a naturally occurring function. If you never had to eat again and never had, you know, and your bait, weight just naturally balances itself automatically, I guess there wouldn't be any more eating disorders, but people have to eat. They don't have to drink. They don't have to use drugs. They don't have to gamble. They don't have to game. So people can live perfectly happy lives without those activities, whether they're substances or their behaviors. But people don't live perfectly healthy lives when they eliminate food or they eliminate sex. So even in the process of saying, for example, is masturbation okay for me? Well, it might be or it not be, it might not be. Um, I might need to sit with someone as their sponsor and say, it's been two years since you masturbated. I guess you should try that and see if it happens and if it becomes compulsive or if it doesn't, or is that a slip? No, it's more a readjustment of a plan, but it might lead to some slips. And then the person needs to say, you know, this didn't really work for me. So this isn't a black or white program. And I know that that scares you spouses. Um, and I'll just say what I always say about this. Um, and I gotta tell you, as someone, Tammy, I, I got to do the, the the short or the long version of this. Which one do you want? You can't get both. This is really important stuff, so go for it. Um, I was in therapy about two or three years ago. I'd been in therapy many, many years, but I was in the therapy on this particular day. And I was traveling a lot for work at that time. And I went into the therapist's office. It was like a Tuesday on at 10 o'clock. And that's when my appointment usually was, but the therapist wasn't there. And uh, so I sat there and I sat there and she wasn't there and she wasn't there. And she was important to me. She was a good therapist. I relied on her. So I texted her and I said, um, I'm concerned you're not here and I'm waiting for an appointment. And she wrote back and said, oh, I'm so, so sorry. But we had said last week that you were going to be traveling and therefore you weren't going to be able to make it. And of course she was right. I had forgotten, you know, a cigar is always a cigar. So maybe I didn't really forget a part of me needed to be here there. But nonetheless, I realized that I was sitting in her office and I had forgotten that uh, we were not going to meet. And there I was and she wasn't there. Um, now I can explain the why in a moment, but um, I can tell you what happened is, and this was, I don't know, six years ago. The first thing I thought was, I want to go see a sex worker. I wonder if I get on an app, how long will it take me to do this? In fact, I'm in a certain part of town. Maybe I don't even need an app. Maybe I can get in my car and look for a massage parlor. And I got about that far and I thought, hmm, you know, I don't think I need to have sex today because I've had sex recently. And hmm, I don't think I was horny this morning. And hmm, I think I seem to have this program that tells me before I have sex, I'm going to talk with someone. And so I picked up my phone and I called one of my recovering friends who's in the neighborhood. And we sat down and had lunch and talked about this and that. And I don't even know what we talked about. But by the time lunch was over, I didn't really want to do that anymore. And so we call that taking a contrary action. We call that, um, you know, making an opposite decision, all kinds of things. But the bottom line is that I have no expectation of myself, you know, Mr. Guru, sex addiction, or whatever you want to call me, or, you know, just call me a, a, a caring writer. But um, I have no expectation of myself after 35 years of recovery and 25 years of doing this work that I will not want to do it tomorrow that the certain degree of stressors and mixes of circumstances will lead me to want to do it tomorrow. And there will be a day when my support net and my safety net and my whatever is not in place and something's probably going to happen. And I'm going to sit down and then I'm going to say, gee, I wonder how that happened. And who do I have to tell about this? And how do I get support? Because that's a slip. And then I move on. 
a relapse is if I returned to that behavior and I kept doing it over and over again and I didn't tell anyone, that's a relapse. But the idea that we might slip uh, once over time or twice over time, I think is inevitable. The challenge is that spouses do not want to hear this. And spouses say to us, and this is true, we hear this all the time as sex addicts, if you ever do this again, I'm going to leave you. And unfortunately, as much as you may feel that way, I feel like if this happens, I'm going to leave you. The reality is, is that number one, if you tell us you're going to leave us, you don't do it. Your word doesn't mean much. So if you say you're going to leave, you better leave. But if your goal, and I think this is the greater goal as a partner, is to have someone who is honest, to have someone who has integrity. Integrity doesn't mean I'm never going to do it again. Integrity means if that were to happen, I'm going to go to you and I'm going to say, I want to be one whole person with you, not leave, live over here with lies. And so my integrity means I have to tell you the truth. And partners, those of you who don't know this, I can tell you without, without question that you will hate that we acted out. You will hate that we had a slip. You will, you will feel like you, you, that was the reason you never should have forgiven, forgiven us because of all those terrible feelings it brings up. But on the other hand, if you sit back for a moment, you will realize that maybe for the first time we have been honest with you. And that feeling for you spouses of, you know what, this could happen or not happen, but at least I'll know what's going on in my life, I think is the real sign of recovery. Because what I see you spouses struggle with the most is just saying, I just want to know what's going on in my life. And I think the addict who is coming to you and really letting you know what's going on on their own is perhaps a greater gift to you than the spouse who never slips again. And personally, I don't fully believe them, but that's just me. Now the addicts don't like me now, Tammy, and the spouses are thinking, I'm not sure about him. <laughs> um, what do you think? That was the long version. That was the long version. And, and, and like, I don't, I, 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 with chemicals, you know, it, it's very black and white. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I know for today, I do what I need to do to take care of myself so that, you know, today is okay for food. You know, I've struggled with food addiction. Um, and since, since I got into, um, a recovery for that, I have not acted in those same behaviors. Have I had too much chocolate cake at times? Sure. But does that immediately send me in? I have to be really careful of my mind space with that, but that's my recovery, you know, working on that. So, so I, I kind of go, you know, like, I, I know that there's no guarantee. I don't, I don't tell anybody that I'm forever going to stay in recovery and I'll never relapse. I've, you know, chalked up a few 24 hours. So I'm, I'm really clear that it's not a given that I always will, but I, gosh, I mean, what I heard with you is I was in a vulnerable place and you did the right things. You picked up the phone, you called, you, like you, you looked at it. So, so I think that there's opportunities to, to insulate ourselves to, I always say, I'm doing what I need to do. It's my insurance policy for today. That's all I got. So, so, so I don't know, I, like, I don't know that a slip or a relapse, I don't think a relapse has to be inevitable. I, I don't know about a slip. I mean, it's a little different, but, but from a food standpoint, you know, thus far, I have not, you know, done those specific behaviors that would be identified as my problematic behavior. So I don't know. So I want to add actually one little thing to that in a much sure. more general way in terms of how I look at our issues, but I'm not a betrayed spouse, mm -hmm. is that if you said to me, oh, my wife has depression and it's put her in treatment and I wonder, will she ever get depression again? I mean, she's on medication. And my answer to you is, I don't know. You know, maybe if her mother were to pass or she had postpartum or, you know, maybe she'd be doing great for years. And then all of a sudden something really rang that bell or it could be uh, hormonal. And so I don't think, and that's true for some of us in some ways too, believe me, hormonally at 35, I was very different. Thank goodness <laughs> that I'm not, I'm not like that now, but in any case, I, I think that there's all kinds of ways to look at this and not simply uh, in terms of lapse or relapse or good or bad. And I know that every partner wants good or bad, which means should I stay here for the pain, even though there's going to be pain, or should I walk knowing that there's going to be pain? And can I say one more thing? <laughs> so I don't know if you remember, I did this podcast with Dr. Stan Tatkin, who really mm -hmm. is one of my heroes. And it's a wonderful podcast about relationships. Um, and he does this great Twitter feed all the time about relationships. 
Um, but one of the things he talked about, which I really appreciated, he said, remember the last good time that you and your spouse, you went to dinner and you had fun together, you went on a vacation, you spent time with family, whatever it was. Remember how fun that was and, and you know how much you enjoyed each other? And, and I can think of quite a few experiences like that. I'm grateful. And I said, yeah, I, I can think about that. He said, now, do you remember the times when you fucking hated each other and wanted to throw rocks and wouldn't talk for three days and, um, and you know, wanted to walk out and, you know, whatever it was. And I said, yeah, yeah, I can remember those times. And he said, well, both of those are your marriage, both of yours, and you've chosen both of those things. And I'm not saying that anyone should stay around to be hit or physically violated or emotionally abused. But when times are tough, that's what we signed up for. That even if we're the hurt one, that's what we signed up for. And I'm not saying again, so you said let someone beat you or emotionally abuse you or parade an affair in front of you. I'm not saying that. You have to you have to put yourself first in terms of mental health. And on another level, you know, uh, in sickness and in health. And um, like depression, like anxiety, addictions are one of those diseases. You can't predict them. The person can't promise you they'll never feel that way again. And uh, really, it comes down to where we started, was th which is their motivation to want to remain healthy. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and that, that, to me, that's the biggest factor. If if someone is actively working, you, you know, on recovery, and you you're seeing changes, like that speaks volumes. If it's just lip service or checking off, you know, I was talking to somebody. If it's just checking off calendar boxes, it just doesn't. You know, it doesn't at the end of the day do anything. There aren't is well, like the ninety days. It's like it, if nothing really changed, nothing really changes. So, you know, I want to be in a relationship with somebody who's my partner. Like you talked about, Doctor Stan Tech, and it's like, you know, partners in thick and thin. And you know, even if it's putting ant traps together, you know, we're doing it together. So. <laughs> Okay, next question. My husband has been sober since D-Day, November of 2020. Why is there not, uh, why is there not no withdrawal since acting out was habitual all of his life from porn, strip clubs, massage parlors, prostitution? And my question is, does he drink, smoke, vape, uh, game? Um, you know, is he watching porn? Like, is there some eat? Food is a biggie. Is there, I mean, there, I talked to so many people and they're like, they've, just shifted to another form of numbing out. So what are your thoughts, Dr. Well, um, I think, you know, we'd have to define withdrawal. I mean, we're not talking about heroin addicts who are sweating and twitching and having seizures. We're not talking about alcoholics who also have their own kinds of seizures and can, uh, you know, uh, have brain, really profound brain issues. You know, we're not talking about, what are we talking about in terms of withdrawal? Is it a physical? Is it something that's emotional? Is there even much research? So tell me, Tammy, you have hung around the sex addiction world for so long in a good way. In the research I was just going to say that sounds you know, so bad. Yeah, you've hung around us sleazy people for so long. Mm -hmm. um, so what have you heard about this issue? Because it's, it's you know, uh, much discussed, I think. It is. And actually, uh, so uh, search engine optimizations, SEO is on our website. One of the number one things that is researched is porn addiction withdrawal. So it's fascinating uh, to me that this question is being asked. And that is on, on multiple of our sites. That is a topic that is being um being sought out. So, and it doesn't say uh, what, uh, is this porn strip clubs and massage parlors, but I mean, it was more comprehensive. So, so I'm not sure, um, but I would be curious. I mean, when I, when I talk to people, I go, you know, are they gaming? Are they gambling? Are, you know, are they drinking cannabis, you know, using opiate stimulants? Is there some chemical? Um, is there, uh, is there, you know, food? Like, you know, I would talk to one person and Oh yeah, he's gained 50 pounds, you know, in a short amount of time. So, so, so that means there's something else that I'm doing to numb out, you know, it just switched from something, um, you know, in our treatment center, we don't even permit, uh, um, oh, internet addiction. Yeah. So in our treatment center, you know, we're a non-smoke, non-vape because Dr. David talks all the time about how smoking and vaping, you know, that, um, that hits the same dopamine areas and, you know, is more problematic for relapse. So. You know, Tammy, I just have to say something, I, you know, going to any 12-step meeting, but especially when I would stop in on AA and NA and the cloud of smoke that you would see out in front. And I would just think, 
or all the donuts, right? The piles and piles of donuts. And I thought, well, you know, good Lord, whatever it takes to get sober. But there's such an exchange um, one for the other so often. Coffee and, that and donuts and cigarettes. Yes, that was a great combination. And most, and Coca -Cola. most yeah, most 12 steps are, you know, they still have coffee, but it isn't cigarettes. And but there's still probably donuts. So, so I did write a couple of things down for this question um, that which is really, you know, what would withdrawal look like? And just to number one, um, well, two, number one, if I were going through withdrawal for porn issues, I might not know that's what it was. Hmm. I might find myself feeling like I had a cold or feeling like um, a tired all the time or, you know, how the brain recovers and how it responds to whatever I, the ways I've been stimulating it and based on how my brain is built might be different than other people. But I'll give you a general list of people who were maybe having to change a consistent behavior and what they struggle with as a result of having to give up that behavior in general. And Tammy, you could throw some in here. When I, um, what Tammy said, number one, co-occurring disorders. So many people I've worked with gain 35 pounds when they stop their acting out. Um, you know, and that's not, or, or especially someone online, they start gaming or they start spending or they start looking for other ways to get into, the, or they stop or they get involved with trading whether it's mm -hmm. cryptocurrency or stocks, you know, they become day traders, all of that intensity stuff. So co-occurring, they isolate. I mean, if you think of someone who's spending four hours a day looking at porn, are they still home alone spending four hours in front of that screen? And if they are, that's isolated. If I spent four hours alone doing nothing without seeing other people. So um, uh, depression, you know, I think people can get very hopeless sitting in the dark. And especially just, to, I want to say, um, for men who are compulsive masturbators to porn, you know, we don't really feel good about that. You know, we're the guys who we can't even get it with people. We just have to sit in our little rooms like when we were 14. So we have a lot of self-hatred about having that particular piece of it. Um, and so we tend to be more isolated and we're more isolated people um, in that way. Um, what I want to say... Um, uh, there, for most sex addicts, one of the things that I experience and talk about a lot, which I perceive as withdrawal, is this sense of longing, this sense mm -hmm. of loneliness. It's not a sexual desire. I think it actually has to do with dopamine withdrawal. Dopamine produces longing and a desire for and a looking forward to. That's the kind of emotion that produces. And so when that goes away, you get this sense of something's missing, if you will. Um, uh, oh, irritability. You know, why are you bothering me? I'm, I'm trying to work on this thing. I'm going to five meetings a week. Either irritability is going to be a key sign that, you know, I don't have this thing to grab onto when I'm not having a good day. So when do I think a porn addict is having a good day? When they're outside <laughs> and they don't have a device in their hand. Um, when they're taking a walk, when they're out with a dog, when they're playing, doing something with friends, when they're hanging out single or when you get people out of the house. And I don't care if I'm doing this. It is still the same. I'm not sitting around in the dark. Um, and I got I to gotta tell you a little story, really, Tammy. I, the other day I wanted to lie outside. It was a beautiful day, but I brought my phone. And there was this lovely view and, the, and I could hear, you know, the wind and it was just a beautiful day. And I realized that, oh, I could put my phone down and actually enjoy all of that's out there. But it took her a minute, not just put it down, but to realize that I was so in this world, not good or bad or judgment, but I, that I forgot the reason I went out there, which was to be in that world. <laughs> so anyway, I, I just want to throw that out there. I don't, think it's just me, but getting away from that is difficult if you don't have a world out there. Next question. My husband has been sober for a year and a half. In that time, he has gone to at least two therapy sessions a week, four to five 12 step meetings a week, and listens to a lot of recovery podcasts. I have a lot of fear he is faking his recovery, but I don't know how to know for sure. Any advice? Um, well, you know, the first thing that comes up for me is feelings are not facts. And while I encourage every spouse to absolutely trust their feelings, there are often, after, after a period of time, you know, we're talking about uh, a, year a year and, and a half, half. Mm -hmm. then I, I think probably something, there's one thing if your spouse is not looking for this, who doesn't expect to run into it, they all of a sudden find it, and then they start looking around, they find it everywhere. And the spouse who's 
been disclosed to, has gone through the process, has found or been heard most of the stuff, I think you would probably find something in a year and a half if that was truly going on. You know, the question that is sort of underneath this is really the question is how, how can we, regain? how can I regain trust? How can I learn to trust this person again, no matter how much I see them doing? In fact, that make me trust them less. Maybe I don't trust them because, you know, it's sort of a lose-lose, right? If we work too hard, we're looking like we're faking it. If we don't work enough. So how does this spouse learn to begin to trust me again? Tammy? Well, you wrote a book called Out of the Doghouse, which is actually pretty <laughs> darn good about, you know, talking about, I mean, like, to me, it was, are you seeing that his actions align with his, you know, with what he's saying he's doing, you know, you know, are you seeing that that, you know, that makes sense? Um, um, I mean, I, I, you know, addicts lie, addicts can fake things, but, but at the end of the day, it's his actions. And yes, he's going to lots of meetings. He's checking out the boxes, but when you're going to lots of meetings, you're taking in, hopefully he's, you know, work the 12 steps, you know, in a year and a half, you would expect that, you know, you would know about where he is on his steps, you know, hopefully he's gone through steps four and five. I mean, it's like one of those things where, you know, hopefully he's giving you some indication of where he is in the program. I love 12 step meetings. I really do. Um, and topics are great, but it was working the steps that, you know, starts changing things. And, you know, he's going to therapy sessions, at, you know, two sessions a week. That's great. If it's with a you know, qualified person and they're talking about this stuff, that's great. You know, Dr. Rob talked about, you know, behavioral therapy for behavior issues. So, um, so I would suspect if you look, if he's not faking it, you're going to see that, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, even a year ago, you know, things, this is what he would have done. And now he's doing this. So, so I, I think the accountability um, and the actions are where you'll start to see, but, you know, again, the fear is real. He's, he's clearly broken your trust. It's never going to be the naive trust that you had before that, oh, he's never going to hurt me. He did. So. I just, um, I wanted to add that, um, you know, one of the things that came up for me, and this is always a tricky road for me to say to spouses, because they don't always quite understand what I mean, is, you know, what are you doing to restore your sense of trust in yourself? You know, you, a lot of spouses say, well, how could I not have known this? How could I not have seen this? Mm -hmm. Meaning I'm not trustworthy inside of myself. And I, you know, to restore your belief in what you see and feel, where are you getting support for your fear, for your pain, for your lack of trust? You know, the kind of question you're asking here is, and I'm not saying the answer is going to be there every time, but this is exactly what the volunteer groups are for, where, where men or women or whatever the, the group is going, to, is going to sit down and say, well, how do I trust this person again? Or what did you do? Or, and again, they're free. We don't charge for them. We're not selling you anything. I mean, we will sell you other things, but all that stuff is free. Um, you know, there are support groups for spouses. There are books for spouses. I think understanding what your norm is or what the norm is, because I think every spouse I've ever met is asking these same questions or they're calling Tammy um, and asking them. And the last thing that I wanted to say is how often are you talking together about this? Because the piece I didn't see here other than, and I'm getting support by doing these things with a bunch of friends who I go out with every other week and we do, I'd like to see that. Um, but the other thing I don't really see here is, um, uh, what, what, what did I just say, Tammy? No, I lost it. Oh, communication that, and couples. Yeah. yeah. Why aren't you meeting? You, you know, we say this a lot. Do you have a 20 minute session when you're committed as a couple at nine o'clock at night to sit down and talk about these issues? You know, he may say, well, there's nothing new. I haven't done anything. You can say, well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to restore trust. And some days I feel this and some days I feel that. And, you know, and I want to believe you, but I'm not sure. And, you know, if you had to find a time to bring that up, then you don't have to go. And I think spouses do. Well, he or she would bring that, this up if they understand how much this hurts me or, or addicts think, well, if I bring this up to them, it's just going to upset them again. So I better not say anything. And you guys end up not talking about something that you both want to. So if you put time aside and say, we're just going to do this, uh, you know, good or bad. And when the time's over, we're going to stop. Um, that is a really great way to, to build trust and faith in this situation. Eddie Caparucci does a very good job on his webinar, Getting to the Other Side. And I would invite you, that's the third Wednesday of the month. Um, it's on the sexandrelationshiphealing.com site. So every, every 
every Wednesday we've got rotating um, uh, hosts. So, so check that one out. Um, but I think you'll find the topics and it's very practical um, advice on communication and a plethora of other things too. Well, you mentioned Eddie and you mentioned someone else earlier today. Who was that? Someone else who Trey does Love. Um, Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's so, a, there, yeah, yeah, there's a well, lot. Well, the reason I mentioned them is we've invited them and gotten them to add to the program by working Saturdays. And so starting, mm -hmm. I don't know, a week or so, we're going to have a Saturday program where these gentlemen are going to come in and work with our clients because I think busy hands are happy hands. Did you get that busy hands? Yes, or happy I did. Hands? Yes. And, and that works for you too, Tammy. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> and also, you know, I think that having some themes and work happen during the weekend um, is really important. And these two gentlemen are some of the ones who are going to teach it because they're both such um, excellent facilitators. So have a good night, Tammy. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who joined us and uh, we'll be back. We'll be back. Happy 4th.